Okay. Good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Cyril Meyerowitz. Uh, I'm a faculty member at Eastman Institute for Oral Health at the University of Rochester. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all here today uh, to the fifth Eastman International Alliance Global Rounds. Uh, we're very fortunate today, as we've had in the past, to have institutions from uh, four of the Eastman uh, Global Institutions uh, to give presentations. And I should add that each one of these institutions, as you'll see when I introduce uh, the excellent speakers, uh, have a link to a university, and uh, uh, the university is central to our functioning. Uh, the Eastman, the rounds today will be the same format as in the past. Uh, we will have four presentations. Each presentation will be 22 minutes. Uh, it uh, will probably uh, last 18 minutes for the actual presentation, or uh, a little bit less or a little bit more, but hopefully there'll be a chance for questions. Uh, I'll remind all of you that if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A tab. You can uh, put a question or write a question in the Q&A, and I will be collating the questions for each one of the speakers so they can address the question immediately afterwards. Uh, we also invite the other speakers to ask each other questions or comments if they wish, uh, and that normally works extremely well. Uh, I do also want to welcome uh, Mahari. If anybody is there from Mahari, welcome. Uh, we're happy to have you. And I want to add one additional item, which you'll be hearing more about. And that is, uh, we put up a website uh, yesterday. It went live. I'll be sending out information, uh, which carries the video archives from previous Eastman Institute Alliance Global Round presentations. So a number of you have asked for these presentations to allow your faculty or your residents to see them if they weren't able to participate. So uh, we'll be giving out that information or sending it out to your institutions. They will be able to uh, go and access them. So it's a great pleasure to start out. We normally have a format uh, where we uh, allow the people uh, who give presentations to uh, move from first through to the end. And this time on the rounds, we have the Eastman from Rochester to give the presentation. Uh, uh, Eastman from Rochester uh, faculty represent uh, the Eastman Institute for Oral Health, as well as the University of Rochester. And we have two presenters here today. Uh, I'm not going to give you their bios. They're all excellent people who are professors in the institution. I'm just going to mention their names for everybody. Uh, we have Junot Khan uh, and we have Maithili Kaladka who are going to give the presentation. So let me hand over to uh, Junot right now. Thank you, Junot. Thank you, Dr. Myrowitz. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Eastman International Alliance Global Rounds. My name is Dr. Khan, and today with me is Dr. Kaladka. The topic of our presentation will be peripheral and centrally mediated masturbatory pain. I'll start with the definition of pain. It's defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. This is a very broad definition and does not cover the entirety of the experience of pain. Pain is a subjective experience, and it's well known that the way one perceives, detects, and even responds to pain is highly variable amongst individuals. Pain can be classified in many ways, according to its quality, frequency, intensity, or location. The most accepted broad classification among various, health, various areas of health and science are according to its duration. It can either be acute or chronic. Acute pain is also known as physiological pain and it serves as a protective mechanism. It alarms the body that something is wrong and warrants attention. The pain is often proportional to the injury and as healing occurs, the pain dissipates. The treatment options are very successful with a high favorable prognosis. On the other hand, chronic pain is pathophysiological with no benefit to the body. In fact, in many cases, it becomes a nuisance for both the healthcare provider and the patient in terms of management. 
The underlying mechanisms are very poorly understood and the treatment often relies on the experience of the healthcare provider. Traditional analgesics are not successful and a wide variety of medications such as anti-epileptics and antidepressants are used on a trial and error basis and the experience of the healthcare provider to treat these conditions. By definition, clinical success is a reduction of 40% of the chronic pain, meaning that the patient still has to live with some residual pain that can alter the quality of the life of a patient significantly. Moreover, there are probably the most treatment options available for chronic pain. It can include medication, surgery, hypnosis, physical therapy, chiropractor, herbs, cognitive behavioral therapy, tense, yoga, acupressure, acupuncture, electrical stimulation, and the list goes on. Unfortunately, the reason for this discrepancy in management is because we are still not able to understand the underlying mechanisms of chronic pain. In brief, we need to treat acute pain whereas manage chronic pain. And it's important that we educate our patients so they understand and have the expectations accordingly. And not only that, but we develop a relationship of trust amongst our patients. Many of our patients that do present to a dental setting primarily present with either the reasons for aesthetics or pain. So regardless of what area of dentistry we practice, we all are somehow or the other dealing with the diagnosis and management of pain. In brief, the inability to control pain will lead to treatment failure. Chronic orofacial pain can be divided into three broad areas, temporomandibular disorders, which is an umbrella term, TMDs, encompassing both masticatory and joint problems. Neurovascular conditions can include headaches. In our case, in our profession, mid-face migraines and trigeminal autonomic cephalgias are of great importance. Finally, neuropathic pain that can be caused by a disease or disorder of the nervous system at the central or the peripheral level. In dentistry, we perform routine procedures on a daily basis, including extractions, root canals, restorative work. Therefore, we have to be cautious about these neuropathic pain conditions. The diagnostic criteria for temporomandibular disorders are guidelines that help identify and standardize various orofacial pain conditions. It covers both myogenic and joint pathologies. For the purpose of this presentation, we will be focusing only on the muscle component, which can further be divided into three categories. It can be local myalgia, where the pain is localized to the site of palpation, myofascial pain, in which the pain extends beyond the area of palpation but it's still confined to the vicinity of the muscle. And finally, myofascial pain with referral, where the pain is referred to a different area instead of the primary muscle responsible for the cause and initiation of pain. Musculoskeletal pain is the second most common rheumatological issue in the body. In the orofacial region, it is the second cause for pain following tooth pain. However, it's the primary cause for non-odontogenic related pain. If you look at the prevalence, it ranges anywhere from 5 to 12% in the general population. The mean age is between 30 to 40 years of age, and females have a higher predominance. Clinical features usually include dull, achy pain that is often aggravated with function of the jaw, which can affect everyday function, such as eating, chewing, yawning, and talking. This can have a severe impact on the overall quality of life, especially if it becomes chronic in nature for the patient. The important thing as a dentist is to be able to distinguish this type of pain, especially as it has the ability to refer pain in the teeth. Many times it may lead to unnecessary dental work, especially if the site and source of pain are not the same. The treatment options can range anywhere from palliative management with home care instructions, such as soft diet, thermal compress, prevention of overextension of the jaw, in many cases, we do prescribe anti-inflammatories or muscle relaxants on a short-term basis. Sometimes appliances are used, especially in patients who grind and clench. And the idea is to prevent tooth wear and to distribute the forces equally amongst the muscles, but it does not directly treat the muscle pain. In chronic cases, patients can be sometimes referred for physical therapy. In many cases, we perform stretch and spray using fluoride methane or even ethyl chloride, 
as a cooling agent that provides a sudden drop in the skin temperature and produces a transient and a temporary anesthesia. It does so by blocking the spinal stretch reflex and the sensation at the higher centers of the central nervous system. The decreased pain sensation allows the muscle to be passively stretched towards normal length, which helps inactivate the trigger point. Trigger points are often found in myofascial pain and trigger point injections are routinely used to treat myofascial pain. Trigger points are discrete, focal, hyper irritable spots located in a taut band of muscle and they can be found anywhere in the body. They produce pain locally and in a referred pattern and often accompany chronic musculoskeletal disorders, referred tenderness, motor dysfunction and autonomic phenomena in some cases. Acute trauma or repetitive microtrauma may lead to the development of stress on the muscle fibers and the formation of trigger point. Often when the muscle is palpated for a trigger point, patients will exhibit a local twitch response. The masseteric trigger point is something which is routinely done. And the idea is to basically inject the masseter muscle with lidocaine without epinephrine as that can be myotoxic in some cases and distribute the anesthetic in a fan-shaped distribution. The trigger point itself can be identified by finger palpation where you run smoothly over the muscle to feel the taut band or with the pincer palpation where you actually hold the muscle with your index finger and your thumb to locate that trigger point. Recent studies have shown that if patients have multiple trigger points in the masseteric region, a masseteric nerve block can be performed. Instead of injecting multiple regions in the face that can be stressful to our patients, a masseteric nerve block has shown to be effective. The analogy is the same as a rebooting your computer when it's acting funny. The system is shut down and hopefully when it reboots, things start back to normal. It's not always effective in all patients and one has to be familiar with the technique and handling. We've provided references on the bottom for the technique and handling of these procedures. Mahela. Hello. Hello. Can you take over for him? It sounds like he's frozen up. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yep. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Today we'll be presenting a case of a 43-year-old female who presented with the chief complaint of pain in the lower jaw and the area of the lower anterior teeth. She reported that the onset was spontaneous and she could not associate it with any specific or uh, features. Uh, she reported that uh, one to two days prior to the onset, she recalled an event of intense yawning. The patient reported that the pain was dull, aching, and in the region of the lower jaw, and it was radiating to the lower teeth. The pain was mild, and it was at a VAS of three at the time of initial onset. She visited a dentist and was advised oral prophylaxis and desensitizing toothpaste. This did not help her complaints and she was referred to an endodontist. The endodontist advised cavity varnish, which did not help her complaint and she was referred for a root canal treatment. The root canal treatment, the root canal treatment did not resolve her complaints and it aggravated the pain. The pain was now a moderate intensity. At this point, she was referred to an oral surgeon. A combination of an antibiotics and anti-inflammatories was given at this point of time, which did not help her chief complaint. The oral surgeon then advised extraction of tooth number 24. Following the extraction, the pain increased in intensity and was now a moderate to a severe intensity. The oral surgeon then advised extraction of tooth number 25 as well. Following extraction, the pain increased in intensity and was severe and extremely disabling to the patient. She could no longer continue with her normal activities. At this point, she was referred to a neurologist who diagnosed her with atypical facial pain and was advised anticonvulsants. 
This did not resolve her complaints as well. She subsequently visited multiple healthcare providers and uh, had numerous investigations, including MRI and CT scans and lab investigations, all of which were within normal limits. Subsequently, she visited the facial pain center. At the time of presentation, her VAS was eight to nine and it was extremely severe pain that she presented with. Her medical history was positive for irritable bowel syndrome and arthritis. A detailed review of systems was done at this point of time and she complained of generalized fatigue and body pain. A comprehensive clinical examination was done. Intraoral examination revealed missing tooth number 24 and 25. In addition, a comprehensive uh, cranial nerve uh, screening. Just uh, cranial wait a minute for Dr. Khan to come back. It will be easier uh, people uh, to come back with a presentation. It might take a minute or so. Uh, because he has the presentation, right? You don't have it. Yes. Uh, what, what do you think, Dr. Marowitz? I have the case as well. Should I start the share screen? He is, he is back and he put it on. There he is. Great. Thanks. The clinical examination, we started with a cranial nerve screening, and this was within normal limits. A TMJ, comprehensive TMJ evaluation was done, and it revealed tenderness and crepitations in the right and left temporomandibular joint. A detailed musculoskeletal and cervical examination was done, and this revealed trigger points in the masseter and the digastric muscle. The cervical range of motion was restricted, and she had a forward head posture. Her headache history revealed that she had menstrual migraines. Her sleep quality was poor and the malampati score was two. At this point, a local anesthetic infiltration in the region of the lower anterior teeth was done. And this failed to resolve her complaints. A local anesthetic infiltration is one of the cheapest and most clear diagnostic tools to rule out odontogenic from non-odontogenic pain. Local anesthetic testing in this instance failed to resolve her complaints. A vapor coolant spray and stretch of the digastric was done and this resolved her complaints. She was diagnosed with digastric trigger point referred masticatory pain. At this point, she was referred for a trigger point injection. A trigger point injection of digastric is extremely rare and the trigger point injection to avoid complications in this instance, it was done using ultrasound guidance. The patient had 80% relief of her complaints. This was supplemented by pharmacotherapy, physiotherapy and appliance therapy and with home care instructions. At one year, there was 90% reduction in her pain and the pain had reduced from a VAS of eight or nine at the time of presentation to a one at the time, one year later following treatment. You're muted. You're muted, Dr. Khan. You're muted, Khan. So the question that arises is that is masticatory pain a product of the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system? And the answer is that it can be either or both in the same patient. And it was the same situation in this case presented by Dr. Kalatka. The important thing is that the central component was picked up by the dentist and an appropriate referral was made for further evaluation. Dentists play a very underappreciated, important, and significant role in the overall health of a patient. Many times, Patients find out about their hypertension, diabetes, blood disorders, sleep disorders at a dental chair setting. And central masticatory myalgia is no exception. If you look at the history of the patient presented in this case by Dr. Kalatka, some of the red flags were irritable bowel syndrome, arthritis, generalized body pain, and fatigue. 
Sometimes all we have to do is ask the patient if they have pain anywhere else in the body and if it's limited to bone, muscles, or both. This may or may not warrant further investigations, but it can also be vital in our treatment and future management. One such widespread pain is fibromyalgia, and it is important because there's a, there's a high overlap of fibromyalgia and masticatory pain. By definition, the American College of Rheumatology defines fibromyalgia as the presence of widespread pain for at least three months with pain in at least 11 of tender points on digital palpation. Again, the problem is that the definition is so broad that it doesn't cover all areas of the disease. Initially, when the American College of Rheumatology came out with this criteria it was accepted, but over the years, as the understanding of the disease has evolved, it is not practical to use. Some of the limitations include, what if somebody has less than 11 trigger points? 11 is a very arbitrary number. The pain may wax and wean, and it could be migratory in nature. Tender point measure does not only tell us that how, an individual, how much an individual is tender, but also how much distress they are. Tender point sensitivity also can be influenced by a lot of other factors, such as gender, age, poor aerobic fitness, and mood disorders. A recent study done by Arbic and their group basically shows that there's an increased overlap of common pain conditions with fibromyalgia. They looked at temporal mandibular disorders, headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, and lower back pain. The red color indicates more pain, whereas the blue color indicates less pain. We can see that almost in all the conditions, the head and neck area is almost greatly involved. Many other conditions that we often see in our dental patients have also shown to have a strong association in patients with fibromyalgia, such as rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, anxiety, sleep disorders, hypothyroidism, and calcium abnormalities. Clinically, we use a very simple form over here at Rochester, and it's used by many healthcare providers. It's a validated form, the fibromyalgia diagnostic code. It emphasizes on two things, the widespread pain score and the symptom severity score. The widespread pain score looks at different areas of the body, and there's a ranking system, whereas the symptom severity scores looks at some of the basic symptoms that the patient might be experiencing. Once we rank them, if the criteria matches where the WPI or the wide pain index is above seven and the symptom severity is above five or the wide pain index is between four to six and the symptom severity is above nine, the odds of the patient having fibromyalgia are very high. So this is a standardized tool, a very simple tool that we can use in our clinical settings. It's important to understand that traditional treatments that are used for myogenic pain, referring from the peripheral nervous system, do not respond to analgesics, stretch and spray, and even trigger point injections. So it's important for the management and treatment plans for our patients. The management of fibromyalgia can be non-pharmacological or pharmacological. In non-pharmacological, the highest evidence of success is with exercise. Whereas in pharmacological, the FDA has approved three medications, pregabalin, which is an anti-epileptic, deloxetine and milnasopram, which are antidepressants by class. Even though that these drugs are the number one choice and have been approved, all these three drugs achieve about 30% reduction of pain. That means that our patients still have to live with some residual pain. In the last decade or so, a lot of focus has been put into the understanding of the underlying mechanisms of chronic pain and why is it that some subjects are more prone to develop chronic pain or even why is it that some subjects have a transition from acute pain to chronic pain, whereas others don't. The pain modulation system is one's internal pain system that allows to modulate pain. And studies now have shown that the way the pain system is working in the body is often not working efficiently in chronic pain conditions. And some of the common conditions that have shown an association with an inefficient pain modulation system include fibromyalgia, tension type headaches, migraines, osteoarthritis, and temporomandibular joint disorders. The pain system works via the ascending pad tracks and the descending pad tracks, and they primarily work together each, with each other all the time. The ascending path takes the signals from the environment and the periphery to the higher centers in the central nervous system. And it allows us to process and modulate this information of pain in the nervous system. The descending pathway 
usually activates the internal pain combating system, which usually include the activation of the internal endogenous opioid system, endocannabinoid system, and the inflammatory system, along with other symptoms. So there's always a balance of processing pain and information in these patients and the way our body works. Many times the analogy is that the pain volume control system is not functioning properly and there's an imbalance between the ascending and the descending tracks, which causes the initiation and maintenance of chronic pain conditions. Unfortunately, in patients with fibromyalgia and other chronic pain conditions, the system is infected and it's not working properly. It's well established that exercise can reduce pain and it is one of the treatment modalities for chronic pain conditions, especially fibromyalgia, as it, has the acti as it has the quality of activating the internal pain system. I want to briefly go over one of the research areas that we are exploring extensively. Uh, Junod, uh, Junod, sorry to interrupt you, but you, we well over the time and I want to give enough time to the rest of the sure. people. Could you wrap it this up? This is my last slide, minutes? yes. One okay. more after this and I'm done, thank, thank you. you. So we're trying to understand the role of exercise and its effect in chronic masturbatory myalgia and the role that it plays in the central and peripheral nervous system. We had healthy controls and patients with chronic myalgia and they performed exercise on a stepper and a painful stimuli was applied before and up to 30 minutes of exercise. So the red bar indicates patients who have chronic masturbatory myalgia and the blue bar indicates healthy controls who have no pain. We can see an immediate analgesic effect in patients who are healthy, whereas this analgesic effect is not seen in patients with chronic masturbatory myalgia. However, when these patients were followed for 30 minutes post-exercise, we can see that they start to display an analgesic effect, which tells us that it's not that the system is not working, it just takes longer in these patients for it to be activated. So in brief, compared to healthy controls, patients with chronic masturbatory myalgia, the pain modulation is both suppressed and has a different effect uh, in these patients. We're working presently in animal models and I won't go into it due to the limitation of time, but what we can see is that we're trying to understand how exercise induced hypoalgesia can be used to understand if tailored pharmacotherapy can be a tool utilized for future in our patients. We have some exciting results indicating that deloxetine, an antidepressant, and gabapentin, an antiepileptic, work more efficiently in patients with an efficient pain modulation system. This is just to start and hopefully down the road, we can share some more exciting results in the management of these patients. With this, I'd like to thank you and open the forum for questions. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Junad and Maitili, and uh, sorry to everybody for the technical difficulty. I guess uh, after this is the fifth presentation of the Eastman International Alliance Global Rounds, and it's the first time we've had a technical difficulty. So I guess we uh, can assume statistical probability uh, eventually catches up with us. But unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. If you leave your questions in the Q&A, uh, we will go ahead and actually attempt to answer them. I'll pass them along to Junard and to Mike Healy, and we'll answer them later. I do want to move ahead so we can give all the other presenters an opportunity to speak. Uh, our second presenter today uh, is from the uh, Eastman in Stockholm and uh, Karolinska, and uh, her name is Britt Hedenberg Magnusson, and she's going to give a talk on orofacial pain and jaw function in juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, thank you, Britt. It's all yours. So, can you hear me? Yes, very well. You're, you're on and your slides are good. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, as uh, you said, uh, my name is Britt Hedeman Magnusson from the Eastman Institute in Stockholm and Karolinska Institutet. And I'm honored to get the opportunity to speak for you today. Uh, and the objective of my presentation is orofacial pain and jaw function in juvenile idiopathic arthritis so-called GIA. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis is a heterogeneous group of chronic arthropathies with different clinical, genetic, and serological profiles. It is the most common rheumatic disease in children and has seven subgroups, D1, 
defined by the International League of Associations for Rheumatology, ILAR. And the estimated incidence and prevalence in Europe is approximately eight per 100,000 and 70 per 100,000 children, respectively. TMD arthritis causes pain and functional disturbance that can make it hard to maintain good oral health and sometimes difficulties to speak. There is a high risk for chronic pain and inflammation, disc damage, arthrosis, and occlusal changes, as well as facial growth disturbance. We know that as much as 76% of the children with GIA suffer from facial pain, especially when chewing and mouth opening. As typical for the disease, they feel stiffness of the TMGs in the morning. And this emphasizes the importance of a proper investigation. And there are several studies showing the similar results as this one that we did at 2012. So the pain location in TMG arthritis is centralized over the TMG region and cheek and to some extent to the temporal region. The patient's own experience is high incidence of painful and clicking mandibular moments, as well as tiredness of the jaw. This can make them avoid to eat, for example. They also have higher incidence of sore oral mucosa, making it painful to eat and brush their teeth. This is confirmed by a study by us here when, where we found that difficulties to eat had a significant relation to the degree of pain from the temporomandibular joint. As it comes to intraoral conditions, several studies have found higher incidence of caries, impaired saliva, saliva flow and sore oral mucosa in GIA. So what are the signs in TMG arthritis? The most common are local pain that is aggravated by movement and strain, tenderness from the TMGs and masticatory muscles, restricted mobility with deviation to the affected side, sometimes laterally open bite at the affected side. They can feel that they couldn't really bite on the affected side. Uh, associated symptoms is common, such as earache, neck pain, and headache. Swelling is rare in TMG arthritis. Initially, no hard tissue changes on x-ray. Uh, possible an increased joint gap as a cause of swelling inside the joint. The most common clinical findings that we have found in TMG arthritis seem to be increased range of mouth opening, TMG sounds and tenderness over the TMGs and masticatory muscles. We have also found that clinical signs from the temporomandibular system increase with increased disease activity. TMG arthritis in the growing child can cause severe growth disturbance of the jaw and face. During childhood, the majority of new bone formation on the mandible takes place on the mandible's ramus and the condyle. If the growth center of the condyle are destroyed due to inflammation, the child may develop facial asymmetry, might re retrognatia, micrognatia, a sleep, steep mandible, mandibular plane, a class two malocclusion, and symptoms as limited range of motion and functional pain, as mentioned earlier. Here, an example of a typical appearance of a child with GIA, pain and disturbed function in combined with post-normal relations and crowding. 
And here we have another girl suffering from early untreated TMG arthritis. And pay attention to the very small chin and steep jaw angle. If you look at an ordinary panoramic view, you can recognize the short, uh, typically short uh, column mandibular and the flat condyles. You can also observe the typical, uh, let's see here, uh, compensatoric nodges at the base of the ramus. If you have a unilateral arthritis, uh, the, the child can uh, get an asymmetry and divergent mouth opening and inclined occlusal plane occurs uh, as in this. Oh, this girl. Uh, we can see that orofacial signs and symptoms are seen in all GIA categories and seems to be related to disease activity rather than to condylar changes. However, the cohorts are small in the ex existing studies where it would be available to create multi-center studies. So as a summary, pain and dysfunction is common in GIA. GIA arthritis can cause severe facial growth disturbance Disease activity seems to be of great importance. And how do we prevent this? This was the question. How do we know when the TMG is affected? It's often called the silent joint. So the, this come, came to an idea to make a national care program for odontological care of children with GIA. An initial consensus was taking place in Jönköping, Sweden at 2003, and then this was updated in 2017. And at that time with a consensus by, uh, by using the Delphi method, where the participants were anonymous to each other, combined with a systemic literature review. And the objective was to detect early signs of disease activity in order to treat pain and dysfunction and continuously evaluate the influence of facial and occlusal development. And the results, uh, the results was that it is difficult to clinically register an incipient TMG arthritis. And this requires a well-conducted structured survey. And they found, we found a discrepancy between clinical findings and MRI. MRI is gold standard to illustrate the degree of inflammation. Ultrasound examination of the TMG can be a good tool when ever evaluating anti-inflammatory treatment. Intra-articular treatment, cortisone, in the TMG can lead to reduced effusion and lack of inflammation on MRI. GIA patients with polyarthritis who were ad administered uh, metotrexate show less pronounced TMG destruction than those who didn't. And GIA patients more often have plaque, calculus, and sore oral mucosa. The conclusion was that TMG must be included in joint status at all doctors' visit. All patients with a suspected or confirmed GIA diagnosis must be referred to a specialist in odontology with special competence in pediatric rheumatology. In case of TMG arthritis, the pharmacological treatment must be optimized. Local steroid injections should be considered in suspected TMG arthritis. And early diagnosis and treatment of TMG arthritis reduces pain, functional impairment, jaw degeneration, and growth disturbance. 
patients and parents are recommended to perform regular self-check and in the case of signs of jaw inflammation, contact the responsible dentist or doctor. So the result for us here in Stockholm was that all children diagnosed with GIA in the Stockholm area are referred to the Eastman Institute section of orofacial pain and jaw function for examination and assessment. Then follow up treatment while growing up. So we get a referral uh, from the doctor for odontologic screening make the diagnosis uh, with help of medical and dental history and clinical examination. We have documentation with photo and radio uh, radiological imaging. All patients and their parents get a, a thorough, thorough uh, information about the condition and treatment strategy. And the treatment strategy is different between, depending on the uh, status of the patient. If it's inactive, only follow up. If orofacial pain in the absence of arthritis, they get ordinary uh, TMD uh, treatment. And if TMD arthritis, pharmacological treatment, local and uh, general. And if malocclusion and growth disturbance, uh, contact with the orthodontics and then follow up uh, over uh, up to full, uh, full growth. It is very important to listen to the child's description of the pain in the child's way. It can sometimes be expressed as, for example, headache, nausea, tiredness, for example. You must also pay attention to change, changes in the child's behavior. For example, if they suddenly no longer want to chew or think on things they previously did liked, or if refuses to open the mouth when brushing their teeth. Here an example of documentation by photo with the front photo, uh, the occlusion plane, mouth opening, profile and intraoral photos. And there you can see the typical tinted occlusion plane uh, and it's like asymmetry and the uh, 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 mouth opening uh, uh, this is a quite typical uh, site of a, a GIA uh, now with the new biological treatment. The radiological examination, we recommend a, pa a panoramic view as baseline. Uh, it's good for as a baseline, but also to exclude other reasons for the child's pain. Uh, extended investigation with MRI with gadolinium contrast or CBCT after individual assessment and cephalometric exam on orthodontic indication. We have some ongoing projects here at Ismed Institute in collaboration with Karolinska Institute and uh, one is clinical suspicion of TMD arthritis in relation to MRI findings. And uh, it's not uh, published yet, but we have found that relatively good agreement between clinical findings with our examination form and MRI. We have also started to investigate the possibility of using ultrasound for diagnostics of TMG arthritis and or as a guide for intra-articular -artic injections. Another project is prediction of temporal mandibular joint involvement in juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It's a clinical and radiological two-year follow-up prospective study. And we also collect salvia uh, to uh, measure salva biomarkers in children with juvenile idiopathic arthritis in order to see 
uh, if we can use saliva instead of, for example, blood samples that uh, for the children's diagnostics. Thank you so much for your, your attention. Thank you very much, Brit. Dr. Meyerowitz, you froze. So uh, anybody on the panel who would like to make a comment? Uh, anybody on the panel who would like to make a comment or to uh, ask a question of Brit? Brit, it's like you gave such a good presentation. There are there are no questions. Everything totally clear. <laughs> okay. Okay, very clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. We we're going to move on to the next presentation. Uh, we have two presentations uh, on trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, one from the Eastman in uh, London and UCL, and one from uh, the Eastman in Rome and the University of Sapienza. Uh, we actually had them in a reverse order, but uh, the uh, speakers both decided that it would be better if uh, our first speaker was from uh, Rome. Uh, since he's going to give a talk, which uh, the second speaker uh, can then follow up. So I'd like to introduce uh, Giorgio uh, Kruko. Uh, I, I learned how to pronounce his last name, but I'm probably not doing it as well as I should. And uh, Giorgio is from Rome and the University of Sapienza. He's a neurologist. Uh, he's going to give a talk on misdiagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia. So thank you very much, uh, Giorgio, if you could share your screen. Uh, we can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm trying to to get to, to the screen. Yes, at last I made it. And, um, uh, you're so, good. Yeah, well, but it doesn't go full screen. Or some hey, I guess. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much for uh, in, inviting me to this very, very uh, Eastman round. And uh, it was uh, the dean of my faculty, which is the, the faculty of uh, medicine and uh, odontology, to ask me to do this thing. And uh, uh, I am very pleased uh, to hear how our fields. Uh, uh, do overlap very much. And um, coming back to me, uh, you see here a representation of uh, Rome, the Colosseum, and one of uh, St. Stephen Dome in Vienna, because uh, I usually have two labels. One is from the uh, European uh, Academy of uh, Neurology, and uh, one is uh, from the Department of Human Neuroscience uh, uh, at Sapienza. And uh, uh, excuse me, there's a little bit of narcissism, but I wish to start showing that uh, I've been <laughs> uh, finally, because uh, toward the end of my career, uh, received this uh, very nice uh, award by the New England Journal of Medicine, who asked me to write down uh, this uh, summit of uh, trigeminal neuralgia. And uh, the, the other article uh, shown here is uh, the guidelines from uh, my European association, uh, which uh, uh, gives us uh, the uh, certainty that uh, most of what I will be saying are based on evidence. Uh, first of all, uh, let me clarify one thing. Uh, perhaps you know that uh, we have three uh, etiological types uh, of trigeminal neuralgia. The most common is a so-called classical and uh, it is the one that follows a major uh, neurovascular compression uh, of the trigeminal root. Uh, 
this, but then there is a, a secondary uh, third germinal neuralgia, uh, which is a consequence uh, uh, of major neurological diseases such as uh, uh, multiple sclerosis uh, or benign uh, uh, cerebellar frontine angle tumors. And then, and this is, a, is estimated to, to be about 15% uh, of the patients. And uh, uh, finally, there is a, a form which is uh, labeled uh, idiopathic because uh, we don't find anything. Nowadays, we are finding uh, some uh, genetic anomalies uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, a very nice uh, scientist uh, uh, from the University of Yale, uh, who's called Stephen Waxman. And uh, we hope to be able to understand it uh, a bit more in the next future. But uh, <clears throat> all these uh, the three uh, categories um, are just uh, from the etiological point of view. And uh, uh, to diagnose the general neuralgia, we uh, exclusively uh, rely on, uh, on clinical grants. Um, you see here, first of all, the three trigeminal division. Let's see if, uh, no, here we are the ophthalmic or D1, the maxillary or D2, and the mandibular or D3, which uh, uh, for uh, in this uh, Eastman uh, meeting uh, might be important to stress that uh, it goes from uh, the, the lower uh, dental arch and uh, sorry, and um, uh, the lower lip then follows uh, the arch of the mandible and uh, goes up to the temple. So it's not uh, uncommon to have a patient complaining of pain in, for instance, at the temple and uh, at the lower lip. And uh, mind also that uh, the angle of the mandible is not a trigeminal territory, it's cervical. And, but these are uh, also for the skin overlying the mandible. The, the bone is indeed still in the third uh, division. So before I move uh, uh, to the diagnosis of uh, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, I uh, wanted to tell you this. Is, uh, I presume that if you have a patient with very intensive pain in the dental arch, uh, perhaps you may remove one teeth, uh, try an antibiotics, uh, all to no avail. Uh, you cannot find uh, anything to explain the pain. Then uh, the germinal neuralgia may come to your mind. But in most cases, uh, it is not. To diagnose the germinal neuralgia, you need, need to follow the following scheme. It is uh, uh, apparently difficult, but it is not. I hope you can read easily. So you start uh, leading complaint uh, must be unilateral or a facial pain. And uh, then uh, two points that are already very important. The pain distribution must be within uh, a trigeminal territory, whether facial or interolar. And pain must be paroxysmal, which is to say a, a very abrupt onset, uh, duration very short. In the literature, you may find somebody reporting up to two minutes, but in reality, it's just a very few seconds or even a fraction of one second. The verbal descriptors, uh, as you know, can be electrical shock-like or stabbing or shooting and so on. And also the, 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 the end of the pain is most abrupt. In this case, uh, you move to the stadium of possible TN. And uh, when can we say that it is a real TN? When we find a, 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 a typical 
trigger maneuver. Uh, the trigger and uh, uh, not to be confounded with, uh, with uh, the tender points that uh, uh, Junada was talking about uh, that are uh, my official pain, and they are deeper, these are superficial, and most of all, the stimulus must be uh, completely innocuous, uh, uh, very slight. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, puff of air or um, slightly brushing the teeth uh, or uh, um, uh, what do you say, using the towel to, to uh, dry your face. And, uh, and there is a typical, a typical thing that I ask my patients. When you, you dry your face after washing, do you use it uh, like this? And they say, no, I cannot, otherwise uh, pain starts. And I usually have to pass like that. And that's the towel sign. And uh, if you have these three conditions, uh, then uh, you got to, to the clinically established uh, TN condition. And uh, we may stop here. So you have uh, a, a typical uh, uh, trigeminal urology. And uh, to give you some further hints uh, uh, about uh, what may happen uh, in your setting, uh, um, particularly if you have uh, that both uh, trigger maneuvers uh, and uh, pain are confined uh, intraorally, then it is clearly more difficult. Uh, but uh, you may rely on radiation. Usually, uh, neurologic pain is never felt uh, within uh, one tooth. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have a pain that is uh, fixed, is, it is uh, produced uh, by chewing, for instance, uh, and uh, remains there, and then it is not. But uh, if uh, when, when the patient chews, and then uh, the, the pain absolutely radiates uh, proximally along, for instance, the course uh, of uh, the mandibular nerve, then it is far more likely to be a trigeminal neurology. Mind that uh, the, the fact of finding uh, um, the, the presence also of a non paroxysmal, long, long lasting or continuous uh, uh, pain in the background uh, does not exclude the trigeminal neurology because uh, about 30 35% of patients. Uh, have the so-called atypical form uh, that consists uh, of uh, both kinds of pains. But they, even though they have this uh, 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 constant pain in the background, uh, they also must have necessarily the paroxysmal pain. And uh, you may find some uh, valid trigger maneuver. Then the second part of this uh, with uh, uh, the etiological definition, and uh, uh, to do that, then you must uh, have uh, uh, laboratory tools, uh, radiological or uh, neurophysiological investigations, because uh, clinically speaking, there may be no difference uh, at all between the three etiologies. And um, let me go on. Again, in this uh, beautiful uh, uh, drawing from the design department of uh, the New England, and uh, who modified uh, very artistically the results of our computer system that uh, uh, calculates areas and changes color according to the frequency. This study was done in. 160 patients uh, with uh, classical trigeminal uh, neuralgia, and you see that the area, the extra aura area, more interested are the alanasi, the upper lip, the lower lip, uh, the maxillary, the skin uh, 
over the maxillary bone and uh, some part of the, of, uh, the forehead. Uh, but then if we go uh, within uh, the intraoral, of course, uh, in our case, the trigger uh, may be, for instance, uh, talking. And uh, there are some particular consonants that the patient uh, learns uh, uh, to avoid. So they speak strange sometimes uh, because they have avoided the, the labial or the palatal uh, consonants uh, when the tongue uh, must uh, touch uh, uh, the, the upper gingiva or, or the use of the lip is uh, very important uh, and uh, uh, but uh, I admittedly admittedly it is far more difficult if a patient only has pain in trauma. Um, what I, I really uh, base uh, uh, my judgment mostly is asking uh, whether you feel uh, the pain there where it was born when you were chewing and it remains there, yes, it is strong, it lasts little, uh, it might be paroxysmal, but uh, if they don't tell me of a radiation, then uh, I feel uh, pretty sure that it is not just uh, a mere dental pain, but uh, it probably is trigeminal <coughs> neurology. And uh, uh, <coughs> Now we move to a more technical uh, um, uh, section of presentation and I uh, ask Cyril to tell me when we are over with the time because uh, the important part I have already, I have already uh, uh, told and uh, may interrupt uh, any moment. But uh, if you uh, look at uh, at uh, MRIs, um, one important uh, uh, notion is that uh, when people talk uh, about the neurovascular contact, this is no longer enough. It is uh, fairly well clear that uh, the, the crossing between uh, arteries uh, and uh, nerves uh, are so common on both sides because uh, the small cerebellar arteries uh, are very, very tortuous and irregular in their course. So we ask uh, uh, now for major morphological changes, uh, such as uh, you see here, atrophy. So this is the brainstem, this is the bone, this is the, the, uh, the, the cave with the ganglion, and uh, this is the basilar artery, and this is uh, the normal nerve, a normal trigeminal root entering the brainstem, and this is uh, the atrophic side. And uh, uh, on the other side of the slide, uh, you see the most typical and safer of all, that is to say something uh, which is usually is uh, the superior cerebellar artery that goes uh, near the root entry zone that distorts the root. And it is, uh, I believe, a bit easier in this sketch of mine. Again, you see here the, the uh, in black, the petrous bone, in white, the CSF. In red, uh, right in the middle is the basilar artery in a horizontal uh, section, the pons uh, and the root. And this is a cerebellar artery crossing uh, the, the root, but this uh, is, uh, is not uh, as safe and uh, certain as uh, looking this. This is again the basilar artery, and these are two sections of the superior cerebellar artery which is looping down and in, in getting up here, it uh, inserts itself uh, exactly at the, where the, the trigeminal root enters the pons and produces a distortion. And if, if you go there, 
histologically, you see demyelination, which is the, at the base of the whole condition. And um, this is uh, from the guidelines, uh, and uh, which was uh, a very uh, comes from a systematic uh, review of the literature, and uh, all the the very many patients that enter from different studies, uh, this analysis uh, were all tested uh, at surgery. So we had uh, in the end a surgeon who said uh, which type uh, of uh, uh, conditions uh, they anatomically really had. And you see that if, if the, the conflict, mere conflict uh, produces, uh, uh, um, which does not produce morphological changes as a huge sensitivity that is utterly unspecific, because uh, you may have it the same uh, on the other side uh, and in normal people. So I see your face means that I'm um, getting late, uh, is it? Uh, yes, Georgia, sorry. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff, but probably if you could wrap it up in a few minutes, and there is a question for you I can give you as soon as you're done. So I just want to, to show you um, what does it look like and what happens. So when a patient perceives this uh, uh, electric shock light sensation, you have uh, along the, the myelinated nerve, uh, you have uh, this uh, high frequency burst of, uh, of uh, signals uh, which are uh, uh, originate from an hyper excitable area that uh, does not respect the refractory period. So the usefulness of the, of the first choice drug is that if this uh, then if you use the sodium uh, uh, voltage gated uh, frequency dependent uh, uh, drugs, uh, uh, blockers, uh, then what you do actually is uh, uh, to smooth uh, the, the burst of firing until uh, the, it, it all disappears. And uh, this uh, remembering this uh, image, and the effect of the drug may remind you of what uh, happens there. And uh, I really thank you for your attention. Sorry, Cyril, if it went uh, slightly uh, longer. I'm done, Cyril. Go ahead, Dr. Marwitz. Yeah, uh, th thank you very much, Giorgio. It seems like we're having a little bit of Wi-Fi difficulty generally, so I'm not sure what's going on, but thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, if you could just give a very, very brief 30-second uh, answer to the question that came here. Uh, somebody asked you, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on the genetic etiology of idiopathic uh, trigeminal neuralgia? And uh, they were interested in who the Yale reference was that you mentioned. So very, very quickly, Giorgio, or you could also answer yeah. a little bit here and later on by, by, uh, by writing. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, usually if there are genetic anomalies uh, of the channel uh, uh, sodium V1.8. But recently in Yale, they found also, uh, um, I, it seems to me, track A, uh, anomalies and um, the reference I don't remember it uh, completely but uh, it has been published uh, uh, this year in Cephalata. Okay terrific thank you very much and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we're going to move now to the next uh, speaker. Uh, our next speaker is from uh, the Eastman in London and uh, University College of London. Uh, and her name is Joanna uh, Zakshevska. Uh, and I got it right, Joanna is saying, yes, I got it right. So thank you. And she's gonna speak and carry on a little bit on the trigeminal neuralgia, speak about uh, trigeminal neuralgia uh, or sooner diagnosis and management. Uh, thank you, Joanna. 
Right. Can you see my slide? Am I? Uh, yes, presentation? You're, you're on your slide. Right. Okay, so this is uh, part of my award winning team that I uh, work with. Uh, that right. Uh, let me see. Ah, it's not moving. I'm not sure why. Just a second. Uh, I'll put that down. You might need to go oh, to right the... okay so uh, what we're going to do in the next uh, 20 minutes is look at the difference between trigeminal neuralgia and short unilateral neuralgia form pain with autonomic features which we shortened to SUNA uh, again looking at the need for a careful history which we've had uh, something there from uh, Giorgio list the key differences between TN and SUNA the European guidelines which have been alluded to and how decision making needs to be improved. So I'm going to go first through the key uh, features of a patient and the investigations, the variants of TN and SUNA, management of these, and then a summary talking about how decisions are made by our patients. So HR is a 69 year old uh, female with a six year history of a very acute memorable onset. And this is a very important factor that patients remember even 30 years on uh, the severity of the onset of their pain. And you can see the average scores there quite high when at their worst eight out of 10. She describes it as episodic single stabs as we've heard in the earlier talk seconds to minutes but sometimes can get a series of stabs uh, but there is no pain in between uh, these stabs and we haven't identified a refractory period. Currently, she's not getting that many attacks every other day, three to five a day. She has had months of no pain, but never been able to stop her medications. And these remission periods, as we call them, are getting shorter. Described as sharp, stabbing, shooting type uh, pain um, and unbearable at times. It's on the right side in the infraorbital area, um, radiating to the eye, forehead, cheek, upper lip, upper teeth. But here again, going back to the anatomy you've just heard of, not the third division. So this is purely first and second division. Provoking factors, typical eating, brushing, touching her face, anything like that. We've heard about cold wind vibrations. During attacks, what the only autonomic feature we elucidated was that she would get tearing of the right eye only, but no redness, no other runny nose or redness uh, anywhere else of the face. No past history of migraine, headaches or other chronic pain. Her impact is huge when it's uh, present. It causes uh, interference with sleep, results in reduced concentration, fatigue, on the HAD scale shows mild anxiety, but no depression. Brief pain inventory, one of our questionnaires, shows significant impact on quality of life and very high catastrophizing levels. In her medical history, she's hypertensive, has a nodular goiter, and uh, you can see some hypertensive uh, medication there. Medications for pain so far, carbamazepine, used in variation of doses over the years, but been used for six years recently or the last uh, four years added in pregabalin but gets significant side effects with these has in the past tried gabapentin with no effect lamotrigine was partially effective but did result in significant side effects again a, a neurovascular compression was found as dr krutko elucidated and here you can see the nerve going through to the posterior fossa with a definite vessel uh, pressing on it so the diagnosis, is this trigeminal neuralgia, classical, as we've just heard, fits that uh, classification, but is it a SUNA because it's got an autonomic feature? Uh, and uh, so as you see, you this same diagram that uh, Giorgio's put up, and so he, she fulfills uh, the classical trigeminal neuralgia features. But what we do need to consider is the autonomic cephalalgias groups, the so-called TACs. Now, cluster and paroxysmal hemicrania don't fit at all because they're much longer attacks. But Sunct and Sunna, which are probably one and the same thing, except that this one is only eye features, these are any autonomic features, need to be considered in her case. 
And there's been a lot of literature about this, uh, some of the earlier ones back in 2008, identifying those. Uh, the Danish group, uh, Steen, has shown that, for instance, in her 158 patients with trigeminal neuralgia, some of them do have one or two autonomic features. And so the big question we've got now, is it trigeminal neuralgia uh, or a, a sun, sunna? Are they the same thing? Do they progress from one to the other? And so we're still waiting for uh, more data to show whether it's the same disease or different. So I've tried to summarize what we've got so far in the literature and therefore where our patient HR fits. And as you see, um, her attacks, she doesn't get that many and her attacks remain quite short. She does have some autonomics, but as we see, it's rare. Whereas in a sunk sunna, they would be very prominent and the patient would even be volunteering that information. Interestingly, in the sunk sunnas, wind is a very big uh, provoking factor. She has got the wind as well. And they respond potentially better, again, no RCTs, uh, to lamotrigin uh, rather than uh, carbamazepine, whereas our patient we see does respond to carbamazepine. We also have this concomitant pain, one or type two, as the neurosurgeons have called it, where we've got uh, prolonged pain after uh, the main attack has finished, but she doesn't fit that. So HR fits the diagnosis really probably best of TN classical. So as uh, Giorgio Crucchio uh, alluded to, uh, these are the updated uh, guidelines from the 2008 ones. And I'm just going to run through some of these for you uh, as the main features there. What we need to remember is that this condition is both medically and surgically managed. The first line treatments are any of the anticonvulsant drugs. They are highly effective but poor tolerability, that's the main reason for withdrawal of these drugs. And of course, therefore you need to do long-term monitoring. When there is poor quality of life, we look at surgery. The major surgery, which I'll show you in a moment, gives you 70% pain-free off drugs for 10 years, but it is associated with a mortality and a complication rate. And of course, which group you're going to fit in as a patient is difficult to predict. Patients who can't undergo or don't want to undergo major surgery, there are a variety of minor surgical procedures which give you 50% pain-free at four years on average, but are linked with sensory change. And the sensory change can be very deep, such as after a, a heavy local anesthetic injection from a, a dentist through to just very mild light touch uh, type changes. But the difficulties are the outcomes. What domains do we go for? And in the medical side, we always talk about a successful treatment if it gives you 50% pain relief, either intensity or frequency. And it's very difficult here because we've got both of these are important and which do patients think is more important, intensity or frequency? They're very divided on this. Complications, are they reversible, such as with drugs, or irreversible after surgery? And what is the quality of life? And these are just some of the measures we currently use, but global impression of change seems to be quite sensitive. And that's why I have a PhD student, uh, Carolina, at the moment, working on trying to develop the core outcomes. Because the surgeons, if you have a surgical procedure, we expect 100% pain relief. So how do patients measure up? 50% improvement on medication or 100% improvement on surgical treatments. Those are difficult decisions to make. So let's have a look at the medical therapies. So in uh, yellow are the strong recommendations from our uh, guidelines. So carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine remain strong recommendations, no change from the old classification, uh, old guidelines. Lamotrigin, gabapentin, and Botox have now entered here. Botox data is quite poor, not a high, uh, that is, there are a lot of randomized controlled trials, uh, but they're very short uh, and huge variations in them. And then other drugs uh, that you've heard used, pregabalin, baclofen, and phenytoin, but all low um, uh, evidence for them. Uh, according to our guidelines. There is generally a very great lack of RCTs and RCTs of large 
uh, numbers. We then looked at acute management, which is particularly important in the dental field. Phosphonitoin infusion needs an admission. There is a trial running in Denmark at the moment to look at this. Uh, but the one I think that we should be really concentrating on, on is lidocaine, uh, particularly as many of the areas are in V3 or V2, and there a dental injection can cause a huge difference to reduce the acuteness of the pain. Uh, giving a lidocaine injection followed perhaps by a marcaine injection. We also recommend topical use, a spray, a 10% spray we have in the UK, or an ointment that patients can put on the trigger point. Now, it's very short lasting, but it does seem to have some effect at reducing the triggerability. And an injection of lidocaine is so much more effective than an opioid, which is often given if these patients go uh, to uh, an A and E uh, accident and emergency unit. So we recommend our patients go to their dentist uh, to get an injection for this. And the injections can be given on a daily basis for a week or two until the uh, dose, the oral dosage dosages are improved. Also remember that carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine, at least in the UK, can be given as a suspension, so as a liquid to enable patients uh, to swallow these. So which and when surgery? Well, from our UCLH data, which is over 10 years worth of data, what we find is that 40 to 53% of patients opt to have surgery. The rest of the patients do manage on medical management. Our patient HR uh, had had enough of medical management, uh, hadn't been successful. She opted for a microvascular decompression, which I'll explain in a moment. And she is now pain-free three years on. So which neurosurgical procedure? Again, no RCTs. Uh, of value. The microvascular decompression is the one we recommend the most. Um, and what it tries to do is separate this often superior cerebellar artery from the trigeminal uh, nerve uh, there. So the nerve isn't injured and therefore results in no sensory change. All the other procedures are ablative. Um, so you enter the Gasserian ganglion uh, through uh, the cheek area under heavy sedation or a small local anesthetic, um, sorry, sedation or a short general anesthetic. You can either, as I say, cook the nerve, heating, radiofrequency thermocoagulation. You can insert glycerol in there or you can inflate a balloon in there and compress the nerve. But as you can see, all of them will result in damage to the nerve. Stereotactic radiosurgery, gamma knife surgery, aims to put radiation into this area, posterior fossa area, is often delayed, so it isn't immediate result. It can be up to six months before you get pain relief, can also result in sensory loss. The advantage of the ablative procedures, these three, is that the result is immediate. In fact, also microvascular decompression. These patients wake up totally pain-free. So what other support do we have? Very importantly, patients need as much information as possible. The Brain and Spine Foundation, which you can download from their website booklet, we are due to upgrade it uh, this year gives uh, descriptions not just of trigeminal neuralgia, but also on uh, other types of uh, facial pain. There are patient support groups, uh, particularly active, and it's very important that patients can uh, find out from other patients, buddies as they call them, because patients will often accuse you, you don't know how bad this pain is. And so they can share uh, information between them and support each other on this. Very importantly, we give patients this uh, document, uh, the Ottawa Personal Decision Guide, this has been around for about 20 years, is reviewed as part of the decision aids in a Cochrane systematic review, shows that this is an effective one. 
So when the patients come to our joint clinic with the neurosurgeons, which I'll show you in a moment, we then list the options that are available to patients, whether it's surgery, which of the surgical procedures may be possible, and also the medical management. And if they have this as a PDF, these open up and they can add in information and try and make some decision that is shared decision making rather than us dictating uh, what they need to do. And I'd like to remind you now of the key features which we've just talked about. So attacks of pain can be a series of stabs or single stabs uh, in the location as we discussed of the trigeminal nerve, character of sharp shooting pain, provoked by light touch activities in the dental world will find uh, quite easy to differentiate the side, uh, very gross poor oral hygiene on the one side, the isolation there is our patient on an island separated from the west of the world. And we do get cycles of pain, control and remission periods. And the impact is huge. We published our series uh, from our questionnaires showing anxiety, depression, and negative thoughts. A large epidemiological survey in Taiwan shows the same features. And we have now just literally uh, two days ago had published our burden of disease, which is a follow up on this cohort six years on showing that we have managed to reduce anxiety, depression and negative thoughts through our pain management program. And this is our pain management program, which again in open access, you can find it in the oral surgery November issue. So after careful phenotyping, uh, by physicians, use of questionnaires and an MRI scan. We can then decide whether they're symptomatic. We then start drug therapy. Our treatments continued on by physicians or clinical nurse specialists. But very early on, we do a joint clinic. There is a physician, myself most often, and a neurosurgeon, and we go through the options. At this point, uh, patients may decide to go for one of the surgical procedures, or they may decide that they're not ready for surgery and they come back into our management. An important arm that we have introduced and we're just uh, waiting for uh, publication of this is we have launched a pain management program for them with our physios and a psychologist. And this has been highly successful in helping patients to get over their fear, their isolation, of dealing with uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So all our patients now get a plan A, plan B, even a plan C. So they know how to manage their pain because fear induces even more pain. So thank you very much to my patients who've taught me so much over the years, all the researchers, clinicians and funders for my work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna. Uh, uh, for an excellent presentation. I, uh, we have a little bit of time. There was one question that came through. If you'd like to uh, take my screen off uh, uh, as well. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the question uh, was from Salapur. He asked, can any neurodegenerative disease like MS cause uh, trigeminal neuralgia? Yes, uh, it is one of the causes of uh, trigeminal neuralgia um, and it's more common in that group of patients than any others. We have published both a systematic review of that and also our initial cohort and we're about to publish our uh, long-term outcome on 20 patients with uh, MS and TN. They don't do as well, they're more difficult to manage, but we do manage them and, and get them somewhere uh, at the end of the day. I would just add to that, if there is young patient with atypical TN, they should be evaluated for MS as well. That's another yeah. thing to think about. That's Can right. And it picks up on, uh, that's why the MRI is a crucial investigation, which will show us not just whether there's neurovascular compression, but will also show us uh, any plaques. Uh, let me just ask, Ellie, if I could just, uh, why, I, it would be great to have additional comments and questions. Uh, while we're doing that, for those people, for, could you please complete the poll? You'll see it up on your screen as well. Uh, it's an evaluation for your CE. So while you're doing that, uh, Ellie, go ahead. I, I just wanted to thank everybody. We had five speakers, and I think that this is a wonderful time for oral facial pain. It became a specialty in the U.S. after many, many years that it was not. This is great. But uh, uh, a question of comment regarding the trigeminal neuralgia and Sankt and Sana. Uh, do you think that this, uh, and through Georgia and, uh, and, and uh, Joanna, do you think that this is uh, 
the same disease or there are just different diseases that have similar presentation because they respond differently to treatment. One thing that I had thought over the years, because in sunk, the response is to cold and touch and to trigeminal neuralgia, it's mainly touch. Maybe it's just different damage to different nerve fibers, like a beta fibers for uh, the, tr the typical trigeminal neuralgia and the C fiber and a, a delta and a beta fibers for the sun. For, for sun. Uh, may I answer? May sure. I answer? Sure. Uh, okay. Um, I, I, we, I think we have uh, uh, enough uh, evidence uh, coming uh, from uh, histological, neurophysiological, and neuroimaging studies uh, that in the case uh, of uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, you have uh, a short tract of demyelination at the precise site, just uh, near the dorsal root and the zone. Um, and this, uh, of course, uh, uh, often a, it is a vessel that compresses and produces uh, this uh, damaging pulsation against uh, the trigeminal root. But uh, uh, it is uh, not a, a dynamic uh, vessel uh, or vascularization uh, problem, uh, such as uh, in all uh, the vasomotor disturbances that go from uh, migraine uh, to all the tasks that uh, Joanna, Joanna has uh, explained us. And um, uh, because of this uh, different uh, etiology, I really don't think uh, uh, that uh, the two things uh, are uh, one thing uh, uh, along a Gaussian curve uh, typical biological curve that may move uh, from typical neuralgia to uh, uh, sooner. Uh, I think they are very different. And I don't believe that is a question of uh, fibers. Certainly not uh, from a beta that I believe are at the base of the trigeminal neuralgia <laughs> condition, the malination of A beta fibers. Uh, certainly not a delta fiber because uh, uh, we have uh, several methods to test uh, a delta fibers uh, in the face area and uh, they are always uh, or either less or in parallel with uh, the a beta involvement. A different question are unmalinated fibers. This may, may play a, a major role in, uh, in, uh, in, in the tax. That's my view. I think it's a multifactorial disorder. We've got sodium inhibition that's abnormal, uh, hence the NAV 1.7, which is what our new drug is working on. There's NAV 1.8. Um, and the interesting question is, why do 70% uh, of patients get a good response when you do a neurovascular compression, uh, decompression, but 30 don't, even though the surgeons report a very clear compression. And I think it's because the etiology is different. There are some genetic factors coming in here. Uh, and I think uh, it's still about very careful phenotyping. And I find my patients sometimes move between a SUNA and a TN as well. And so I think it's still things that we need to be investigating more carefully. There's somebody who's done a PhD on this um, at the National, uh, at our institute, and I hope he will be publishing some of his data uh, to look at that. Could we take, sorry, Eli, there's one more question. Uh, do you want to follow up with Sally and then I'll just take the question? It's okay, take the question. Uh, this is from Dara Shanahan, uh, who says, thank you for your presentation. I think this is for all the panelists. Uh, when referring uh, TN patients for surgical opinion, uh, is there any evidence that early surgical intervention affects long-term success? No, there isn't. I mean, some people have uh, thought that. Uh, some of the surgeons have suggested it. In the long series I followed up, I haven't found that. 
but I think what is important is an early discussion about surgery so that patients can make that decision uh, themselves. In theory, you would think that it would have an effect because if you've got more and more pressure uh, of the vessel on the nerve, you're going to cause more atrophy. But uh, longer series haven't shown that uh, to be precisely true. But I would encourage early discussion with the neurosurgeons. Anybody else want to field their question, Ellie or, or Georgia? Or... No, I, I do not know in the list. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the, let me just take, there seem to be a few questions that might be worthwhile to get the outside questions. Uh, this is for you, Britt. Uh, what progress is being made with regard to identifying biological markers in saliva? or JIA, uh, what progress is being made with regard to identifying biological markers in saliva uh, for JIA? I don't really understand, but we, we have um, finished a collection and we are right now uh, analyzing the, and we have found uh, 17 dif uh, different biomarkers in the saliva, but we haven't yet, um, uh, compared it to the, you know, we, we had, uh, I think it was 30 patients and 30 healthy children. So we want to compare the healthy children with the, with the uh, JIA pa patients to see if there's any difference in, in active disease. Okay, thank so you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Britta. Uh, one other question, uh, is there any relevance between vascular compression with hypertension? Not sure I understand the question, yeah. but maybe somebody else does. I, I, I think that I, is a, a question we should be considering because <clears throat> hypertension becomes more prominent with older age and it is a disease of older age. So hypertension could play a, a role. Anecdotally, I find my patients who blood pressure starts to become unmanageable are likely to get more attacks, but I don't think again, it's the whole story, but it can contribute, I think. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to respond, Ellie? I just want yeah. to... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry Ellie, uh, Dr. Elia, and then we'll go to you, Georgia. Just, just to, to add to, to the discussion, talking about biomarkers and the fact that, I don't know, 70% of the patient respond to medication. We need to move to more personalized medicine and treatment to our patient because the fact that it works for 70% is wonderful, but there's still 30% that it doesn't work for. How can we find those patients and find the treatment to? And to link that to uh, what you not presented, uh, showing, okay, uh, that we have a group of patients in with musculoskeletal pain that some of them are having different characteristics. How do we build that characteristic into treatment which is personalized? So the biomarkers from Brit study, uh, from the, the responses of 70% to a certain medication and the exercise that you not and uh, my TV presented, uh, this is a picture we have to go. We have to look for personalized treatment for patients. It cannot be for everyone the same treatment. And I like the idea what showed by, by the presenters here that you build a system, option A, option B, option C. But can we start with the best option to begin with? We don't have tools for that yet. Yeah, we desperately need biomarkers uh, which are lacking and, and we're trying to investigate some on the imaging side, whether we can find some markers, but definitely biomarkers are crucial. Giorgio, you wanted to make a comment and I, I cut you off. Would you want to uh, go ahead? It was uh, yes, uh, I would like to say two things uh, uh, because uh, unfortunately I have to move away in a minute. Uh, and uh, the first is uh, back again uh, on the, the question about uh, genetics. Uh, and uh, I have uh, replied uh, that uh, uh, in this study in the collaboration with uh, Stephen uh, Waxman from uh, Yale, uh, uh, we found uh, anomalies uh, uh, related to the uh, NAV 1.8, uh, but also I said uh, on the, uh, uh, on the on, I believe on the TRK, uh, and whereas it seems to me it's uh, the TRP, TRP1, 
And uh, uh, the first part has been published in Cephalagia, and the second part is appearing now, or has already appeared these days in uh, uh, neurology genetics. Probably it is already in PubMed. So I uh, will be reading it and uh, learn uh, a bit more. <laughs> the, okay. the other question regards, uh, regards uh, uh, hypertension. I think, uh, so I, I was hoping uh, that uh, uh, hypertension might play a role in the alternation of uh, phases uh, of uh, uh, relapse and remission in uh, in uh, TN, which is uh, one of the few uh, things that we do not really understand. And I started uh, this uh, study doing 24-hour uh, 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 recordings uh, in patients uh, who were in a period of full remission and the same patients uh, that are in a period of uh, uh, very strong neuralgia. Uh, I do not know yet. As soon as uh, we have an indication that uh, the way is promising, then uh, I'll ask uh, Joanna to uh, uh, try a third place in order to have two different uh, 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 centers doing the same things. But uh, up to now, I do not know yet how safe are the results. And with this, uh, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, it was a great pleasure to be with uh, all of you, and uh, I must tell you, Cyril, that I like very much the way you uh, control uh, 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 and manage the, the whole stuff. Best wishes to all. Bye bye. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I, you know, thank you very much, all. It's been a terrific presentation. Uh, thank the audience for allowing us to go over because we're uh, about 10 minutes over. We normally end on time, but I think these are fascinating topics, and it's particularly gratifying. Uh, to hear the interaction among experts in pain uh, speaking uh, between the different institutions. Uh, I, I do want to just add that uh, the EIA uh, Global Rounds will continue uh, next year. We'll be setting up the dates. There'll be four of them next year as well. And we hope we'll be having a lot of different topics uh, and also uh, an opportunity for research presentations uh, so we can uh, begin to think about collaboration uh, among our institutions. Uh, and lastly, just remember, there will be a website coming up uh, so that people can go back and actually view the presentations uh, later on. So if your students or your residents or your faculty uh, wish to do so, uh, they'll be able to access them. Ellie, do you want to say anything else? I think you... I just want to say thank you, everyone. There was another question to Dr. Khan, but that can be answered separately. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Okay. Uh, for those people who haven't had a question answered, uh, we'll get the people to answer the questions directly to you. Uh, Shai Hen Dajo uh, had a question, uh, 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 Junot, that you can answer. Maybe you can just write to him. Uh, he asks about muscle trigger points and does muscle hypoxia from hypertonicity play a role? So we're going to end off right now, but you could answer that question directly by email. Thank you very much, everybody, for a great presentation. Sorry about the technical difficulty, uh, but we look forward to the next presentation. Uh, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much, Britt. Thanks all. Bye.